thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, they always say that this slot on an afternoon uh, conference is the graveyard slot because people get tired. Nobody could have possibly uh, nodded off during Martin's contribution. I have a horrible feeling that they've just postponed it until my contribution because it will be um, a rather dull and dreary contribution relative to the last one. But however, I suppose the formulation of policies in the areas of tax and social welfare is by its nature dull and dreary, so unfortunately that's what I'm going to have to talk about. i just give you a brief outline of what the advisory group on tax and social welfare has been doing. We are, incidentally have finished our remit. We were given a number of items to look into, and I'm obviously today going to concentrate purely on the, the, the disability aspects of those items. But we have actually finished and our, we've submitted our last report to the Minister in August. Um, it's not, the final report's not yet published. The first three reports are published. So that's where we stand at the moment. We were specifically asked to look at, as you probably, most of you who are activists in this area will remember the budget to 2012 proposals in relation to raising the age for domiciliary care allowance to 18 and reducing the rates of disability allowance. Uh, sorry, can you not hear? All right. Okay, sorry. Uh, we were asked to look specifically at those proposals in Budget uh, 2012, and in our report, we did recommend raising the age for the domiciliary care allowance to 18. It's, a, it's an issue that seems to divide people who um, are supportive of people with disabilities, in that there was a huge campaign to retain the uh, starting point for disability allowance at 16, but every parent of every child with a disability that I've ever spoken to wants the age to be changed upwards to 18. But the campaign was didn't reflect that, I have to say. But we considered that it should be at age 18 because we took the view that it was not a good idea to give 16-year-olds 188 euros a week in their own right. It was not a, particularly not a good idea to give them that without an assessment of their capacity to work, their capacity to engage in further education, or, or their ability to take on work at a later stage in life. It is, in effect, a an almost a life sentence to give somebody an, an award at 18 for the rest of their lives and say, that's it, that's all you're going to get because that you we have decided that you have no further prospects. I think it's a dreadful thing to do to uh, young people at any age. I think it's dreadful to allow 18-year-olds to go on to job seekers allowance. I'm talking about 18-year-olds who do not have a disability. I think it's a dreadful failure of society to say that that's what we're going to do. It ought, there ought to be alternatives in form of education, training, etc., available for groups like that. In particular, in the case of people with disabilities, young people with disabilities, there is a crying need for an assessment. And as I come in the door, the previous speaker was talking about assessment of needs. We do not do assessments of needs for that particular age group. At, at stage 16, if they want to get a disability allowance, they have to undergo a means test. Now, if they've got a disability, they're going to pass the means test because for obvious, unless they've had a, a big settlement from an accident or something like that. So, but the vast majority are going to pass the means test. But nobody does an assessment of, A, are they able to work? What, are they able to continue in education? Is uh, 188 euros a week anything like the right amount to give them? In other words, maybe 40 euros a week is the right amount because it would subsidise their transport. Maybe 300 euros a week is the right amount because they need so many supports. But there's no individual assessment of what the need of that young person is, and we felt strongly that that, was, uh, that ought to be there. Apart from that, in the advisory group, we also looked at uh, child income support payments generally and at working age supports. And it's the working age support uh, report that isn't yet, hasn't yet been published. Uh, we also looked at social insurance for the self-employed. I'm not going to address that at all, obviously, today because it's not relevant. But what I do want to talk about now is not so much what we recommended in any of those areas as the lessons that it seems to me to, should be learned from the different way that we try to support people with disabilities and indeed the rest of the population as well. And there are three areas that I think are really important. The first thing we need to look at in the disability area is coordination within the income maintenance system. We need to look at all the payments that we have there and see are they the right sort of payments, are they going to the right, the right people, should we have different payments for different people. We then need to look at our 
coordination between the social welfare system and the taxation system and see where we can change uh, elements of the taxation system which don't well serve the people they're meant to serve. We then need to look at our health services provision and see how the provision of services fits with the income maintenance services because at present there is no coordination between the two at all. And finally, we need to look at education and training services and the issues there are broadly similar to the issues with the health services, so I'll concentrate to a significant extent on the health services end of it. Within social welfare, for instance, we have what are in effect really historical anomalies. We have a blind pension, for example. At this stage, there is no rationale for having a separate uh, income maintenance system for blind people. It was introduced at a time when there wasn't a general system of support for people with disabilities. It's actually much more generous payment than the disability allowance. Well, maybe much more is an exaggeration. It's somewhat more generous payment. It's certainly the means test is more generous. And alongside that as well, we have paid by the HSE, we have a blind welfare allowance. And again, there is no obvious remaining rationale for keeping all those sort of payments. We introduced the carer's allowance in the early 1990s without any reference at all to the fact that there was an existing caring payment for people with disabilities, i.e. the domiciliary care allowance. So we end up in a situation which, where some people are getting domiciliary care allowance plus carer's allowance plus other things, while other people are getting nothing at all. So we end up in, with an inequitable uh, allocation of resources even among people with disabilities, never mind as between people with disabilities and everybody else. The, um, when we changed from, when we brought the DPMA, as somebody referred to earlier, over to the Department of Social Protection or Social Welfare, as it then was, and it became the disability allowance, no, it never seemed to occur to anybody to address the issue of what the result of that would be for people who are living in residential care and how residential care charges would be affected. So in other words, all these policy decisions were made without looking at the ramifications in other areas for, for the people concerned. The, um, the rest by care grant, which is very obviously useful for an awful lot of people, again, the rationale for who exactly gets it isn't all that clear. And it should be. It should be clearer for everybody to see. We have introduced in the last couple of years partial capacity benefit, which it's too early yet to see whether or not it's actually effective for what it's meant to do. But it is a very limited benefit because it's only available for people who have a social insurance record. And there's no similar payment, if you like, although I suppose the means test in the disability allowance operates to some extent in that way, but there's no directly similar payment for somebody who does not have an entitlement to a social insurance-based payment, but who has a capacity to work a limited capacity. There ought to be, it, the system ought to be flexible enough to allow for a partial capacity assistance payment as well. We then, alongside, and this isn't in the Department of Social Protection, of course, but uh, the, we had the, the various mo motorised uh, grant schemes, the, the two that fell foul of the equality legislation. Um, that, the two of them operated for a limited, that's the uh, motorised grant scheme and the mo mobility allowance, Again, they went to a small, limited group, to whom obviously they were uh, worthwhile, of course, but they didn't go to the wider group who would equally well have, have needed them. Now, the theory of the changeover that's occurring there is that a new mobility scheme will, if you like, take into account the wider group who may be eligible, but that's been going on for over a year now and nobody knows where it's going and I'm, I wouldn't be too sure I, well, sorry, I don't know where it's going is the simple reality of it. So I think we need to look at all of those payments and see, it, are they the right sort of payments for the group that we're trying to aim at? There is one huge problem when you do that. If you decide that the uh, you should get rid of a particular payment, the it is almost impossible in our system to, to get rid of payments because the uh, even though that using that money for other purposes might be the right thing to do. The opposition from people who are receiving them is always such that it makes it very difficult to remove anything. Um, I think people in the disability sector have to have a more open mind to changing the system 
even if it means that some people lose. Because it's, it's rather like the medical card argument that's been going on now for some time. Some of the people who lost their medical cards should never have had their medical cards because they didn't meet the criteria. And when an attempt was made to have uniform criteria, war broke out because some people lost them. But lots of people got them because they should have had them. So I think you have to be more open to al allowing changes that do mean losses for some people. The next area that I want to talk about is the whole tax credit system. I mean, as you're probably aware, an awful lot of the tax credits have been simplified and got rid of indeed in recent times. But we still have some odd ones related to people with disabilities. In particular, we have the incapacitated child tax credit. And it's quite an extraordinary uh, credit in that the vast majority of people who would need it are not getting it. And we're not 100% sure of who exactly is getting it. We spend, it costs the Exchequer 42 million a year, which is a not inconsiderable sum of money. Once you get qualify for the incapacitated child allowance, you keep it more or less forever. So we, ha we have the situation where at least we think, uh, we don't know exactly actually, but approximately two thirds of the people who are getting it are not the parents of children in the classical sense of children under 18. They're the parents of adult children who are getting a payment in their own right, because everybody's entitled to get a payment in their own right at this stage. So there is no coherence between that and, for example, the domiciliary care allowance, because only about half the people who are getting the domiciliary care allowance are getting the tax credit. So clearly, it's not going to all the children of the, the, the nation, if you like. The tax credit, incidentally, is worth 63 euros a week if you're paying tax. The vast 39% of the uh, income earners of the country don't pay any tax, so of course it's no use to them at all because they, you have to be paying tax in order to avail of it. It's been looked at numerous times and for various reasons is that we are strongly recommending that it be changed to, and the money saved to used for services for people with disabilities. In other words, it wouldn't go directly to individual parents but would go as services for people with disabilities. The other area in the tax system that uh, we need to look at, and I'm beginning to sound like I have a vendetta against blind people, I don't, but the, there are specific credits for blind people as well. And again, there's no, I don't see the rationale for it. Blind people have disabilities, of course, but they are not any different in their um, requirements from most other people with disabilities. In fact, in some ways, they may be better off than an awful lot of other people with disabilities. We also have the Disabled Drivers and Passengers Scheme, which, with which I'm sure most of you are familiar and Martin mentioned, which is a good scheme for the people who get it, but there are only a tiny number of people who get it. So it's a, there's a huge issue of unfairness as between one section of the disability community and another over the support that they get. In some ways that the disabled drivers uh, and indeed the domiciliary care allowance are sort of nods to a cost of disability payment in that they are provided because you, simply because you have a disability and not on any other basis. Then within the health services, I think this is where the greatest need for coordination arises because, as you know, the HSE um, pr provides various services either directly or indirectly to people with disabilities. But there is no connection between the income maintenance services that are supplied by the Department of Social Protection and the health services. And there's no, you, you know, the Department of Social Protection do their assessment for the domiciliary care allowance. A separate assessment is carried out by the Health Board under the uh, Disability Act. There's no, nothing in there that links the two. And there's nothing that links the needs of the person who is being assessed and says that, well, they need this service, that service, that service. But they also need this amount of money and to uh, pay for extra costs or whatever. So that badly needs to be looked at. It's very difficult to get um, coordination between government departments. I don't know why it's so difficult, but it certainly is very difficult. And I think that's one of the areas that we really need to address very seriously. The, uh, two years ago, I think it was, the, Depart the Department of Health published the review of, dis of its disability services. And in many ways, it summarized all the, or not all, but a lot of the problems that are facing um, 
people with uh, disabilities in accessing services and in having the most appropriate services available. And among other things, it showed that we simply don't know how much individual services cost. We don't know much about the quality of them. We don't know much about the outcomes of them. So all of that needs to be addressed in any sort of coherent policy for supporting people with disabilities. Um, that review, as you're probably aware, recommended that they, we would change from the current, service, current arrangements whereby uh, organisations get block grants for the provision of services to a system whereby uh, individuals would get, if you like, their own allocated amount in order to pay for services. Now, as far as I can see, the, I think there are a few pilot projects in that area in the country, but I mean, it is not, it has not been, uh, rolled out in, in any, to any significant extent. Um, <laughs> yes, well, not yet is a, is a fairly well-known phrase in this whole area. But it seems to me that it's not without its difficulties either, in that the giving individuals uh, the right to have their own budgets, to buy their own services, in principle, sounds very, very good. But there are individuals in the set of people we're talking about who do not have the capacity to manage that money. And the risk of exploitation is considerable. And it has to be recognized that that risk is there. We haven't yet got the, the legislation on capacity and assisted decision making. So I certainly wouldn't like to see this personalized budgets rolled out until we do so that the risks in relation to exploitation would be um, addressed. The, uh, as I said already, educational training is exactly in, in the same sort of arguments or considerations apply in that the, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to repeat to you, you know that people with disabilities in general have a much lower edu educational standard than other people. It's one of the, one of the many reasons why access to employment is difficult. And it comes back again to what we do with young people with disabilities, which as I said at the start, I think should be that at the age of 16, let's say, or 15, assessments should be done in order to establish whether or not they have capacity to work, and if they have, what supports are required, what education supports, what training supports, what needs to be done to encourage an active life, rather than allocating them an amount of money and saying, that's it, we have no further uh, role in your life. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you.